welcome to Stan the Energy Man. Stan Osterman here from the Hawaii Center for Advanced Transportation Technologies. And because you have been such good, loyal watchers of this program, we're gonna tag team today with the two hosts of Stan the Energy Man. I have with me today, Rachel James, from also from HCAT. And she's gonna help me deliver what's latest and greatest in Hawaii on energy, because there's been a lot going on lately. And, um, but before we get started into that, i um, just like to remind everybody, if you had questions from last week on the, on the hydrogen demonstration, um, there is a call in line here at 415-871-2474. If you wanna call and ask us any questions, we can explain or go into detail if you have questions from last week. But it's been a busy, busy year, an especially busy, busy summer and a busy, busy September. And things have just been going crazy. But um, some of the stuff that we'd like to talk to you about today and just get you up to, up to speed on are things like the World Conservation Congress that happened a couple weeks ago and really brought a lot of folks into Hawaii to talk about sustainability and uh, clean energy and just good all around ecosystem uh, care and feeding around the world. Uh, we also had opportunity to visit Kona this week and uh, go to Nelha, which is a whole, um, natural energy laboratory of Hawaii. Uh, and Greg Barber over there hosted a great conference on energy storage. We'll talk a little bit about what went on at that conference. Um, I had the pleasure of attending the Blue Planet's very first fundraiser, Blue Planet Blue Tie Bash um, this week, um, guest of Wally um, Tsua and uh, his, his lovely wife, Kim, and we had a great time there and got to listen to Willie Kay as a, in a n impromptu performance at the end of the evening, just go into his whole opera thing and everything, it was awesome. Um, and just some other things that have been going on in the vicinity and talking about hydrogen and energy. So Rachel, thanks for being here today and co-hosting with me. And uh, let's, mm -hmm. let's update some folks on uh, what we did over at the World Conservation Congress. Yes, let's. Um, so the World Conservation Congress was really an awesome opportunity for Hawaii to showcase many of the efforts that we've undertaken over the past years, um, as well as a really ripe opportunity for us to see what other people who have atmospheres much like ours um, have done with their energy. Um, and so at the Congress, there were a good number of meetings and engagement opportunities for people to learn about energy and island nations, um, as well as just energy efforts across well, across the globe, really. Um, so HCAT had our Power Hour um, Sunday the 4th. And thanks for setting that up. Thanks for being there. Thanks for showcasing. Um, and so what your viewers saw last week was a bit of what you shared with the world, essentially, um, showing them just the simplicity of hydrogen energy, um, its practicality, its ready application, um, and just really showcasing the capabilities that we have with renewable energy today. Well, one of the questions I most often get answered, and I got asked the question that night, was, mm -hmm. Why, if this is so good, why aren't we already doing it? So what's your standard answer when somebody asks you that question? I should get a standard answer. <laughs> I should get a standard answer. <laughs> Depends on who it is. Sometimes I give them like, well, we don't always do all the things that we should do. Mm -hmm. um, that probably is my standard answer. Okay. Um, but the more practical answer is I think people just don't realize um, how readily accessible it is and how advanced the technology is today. Um, so there's not really the momentum, um, both in policy and in practice, to have it be ubiquitous. So we have a lot of work to do to educate people, um, yeah. to get them comfortable with the technology, learn how to apply it, and learn really how it can benefit their lives. And I think that's, that's probably our biggest challenge. Mm. And nationally, I would say that the other factor is that, w that makes it easier for us, mm. um, is, and hard for most people on the mainland is, we don't have a dog in the oil industry or the natural right. gas industry or the manufacturing vehicle industry that other states or you know localities yeah. in the U.S. have. So they they have a natural bent to want to keep their industry going or keep their their businesses mm -hmm. that are centered around those fossil fuels going. Right. While we have a bent to getting off of fossil fuels because we're paying the high price for our electricity and things like that. So that's why I think Hawaii is a good place to, to start it, but because we don't have that roadblock in front of us. Right. And it was kind of neat to have the World Conservation Congress here because um, was this the first time they've done it in the U.S.? Or? Very first time okay. in the U.S. So first time in the U.S., and they picked Hawaii to do it and showcase it. And I think ThinkTech was also showing one of the the clips, um, the uh, trailers uh, during the, the okay. programming cycle mm -hmm. of the um, the um, World Conservation Congress advertising uh, yes. for Hawaii. Mm -hmm. And it had some great shots of Hawaii and great shots all around the world by National Geographic, but some really beautiful scenery in Hawaii. Yes. 
And it brings home the point that the reason that we really should be focused on this is for our future and our mm -hmm. kids' future and keeping Hawaii the way it is mm. because it is so beautiful and pristine and that's what we should be doing. I agree. The so, Congress was really unique. Um, so it's, it's fascinating because Hawaii is a leader in many ways and certainly becoming more of a recognizable leader um, in clean energy. But particular to the Conservation Congress, so the IUCN, International Union for the Conservation of Nature, they didn't actually like come to Hawaii and choose Hawaii. So Hawaii was actually the first state um, to propose that the Congress be held here. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't initially a plan to have like the US as proposal, but generally countries are the ones that propose and then someplace within the country is designated. Um, so it was a unique opportunity um, that the IUCN hadn't really encountered before. Um, and then they got on board with the idea and Hawaii as a state was able to convince them that not only should they bring it to the US, but that it should be first landing in the US in Hawaii. Um, so I think when people understand that story, um, they can better understand really the leadership role that Hawaii is taking in advancing clean energy initiatives and conservation efforts um, and really just taking care of the Aina um, and really showcasing the things that Hawaii as a state has held dear to them um, and evidencing how we have that historical knowledge and we have much of the technological capabilities. Um, and well, we, when you see Hawaii kind of stepped up and, and mm. said we do it, um, but I was kind of disappointed that more state agencies and more state oh, entities didn't get involved in it. Right. <clears throat> you know, where are some of the areas where you, you may have seen that same? I mean, you know, there's certain areas where you think that maybe we should have had a bigger play or we should have, we should have kind of yeah, leaned forward a little bit more into, the, into that forum. It, so because it was a conservation congress, I think um, the state as a whole really depended on DLNR, so the Department of Land and Natural Resources. Mm -hmm. um, they definitely carried the heavy lift yes, in did. bringing it. Um, and then all of their kind of under agencies participated and folded in. So there was definitely an effort on natural resources. Um, but for those who are able to participate, I think they're able to see really the merger between natural resource um, preservation and conservation and how that plays into business and how that plays into energy and really mm -hmm. how it's it's less disparate than people probably perceived it to be. Um, so hopefully for people who attended from other agencies, they can take back some of that. It really wasn't, I mean, conservation is less just a focus on nature and more just a focus on creating a sustainable ecosystem. Right, the sustainability so, piece is critical. Yeah, yeah. Because there's an economic factor to that sustainability and, you know, doing what's right isn't always the cheapest thing. Right. But and you gotta do the best thing. And Agreed. the best thing for long term. Yep. Great. So when do you think they'll come back? Oh, that's interesting. Um, it happens every four years. So I don't know if they'll come back, one, to the U.S., and two, if they'll come back to Hawaii. Mm. Um, I'm not really sure the frequency with which they come back to previous host sites. Did you get any feedback on how it did in terms of contributing to our economy here? Because um, a big convention or a big conference, that's usually one of the reasons why you volunteer for that stuff is yes. brings money into the state. So they had over 10,000. Um, they were projecting for about 8,000, but mm -hmm. actually ended up with over 10,000. So I'd suspect that it was a substantial influx um, in income, but I actually don't know the numerics behind that. Great. Well, that's good news for Hawaii because um, it is about the economy, and tourism is a big part of our economy right now, and, uh, and that was a great forum to bring folks in. And that's why we built the convention center. Heck, we got to start using it more. So those kind of things are great. So if you're out there and you have a big convention to bring to Hawaii, it's the place to bring it. It's probably cheaper than Washington, D.C. and a lot of other big cities to just bring it here, and that includes airfare. You can get good, good deals on airfare when you got the right time frame in, in mind. So let's see, um, the energy storage conference that we had over on Kona, um, that was a great, great event with uh, Greg Barber and the folks at NOHA. Mm. Thanks very much, thanks to them for hosting that and putting on a great event that was um, nationally, uh, well attended nationally. The national labs were there, the Department of Energy was there, a lot of local folks were there um, uh, from local energy and uh, energy storage and businesses. Great discussions, great presentations, um, and, and really uh, it kind of started off battery centric, which was mm -hmm. kind of natural for energy storage. Um, but I was really happy to see that it did start to talk about hydrogen. So both Paul Pontio and uh, Mitch Ewan and um, even Pete Devlin from the Department of Energy uh, all pitched uh, hydrogen for energy storage and how, what it can do for the grid. The projects that no, uh, HNEI is doing with uh, UH, University of Hawaii is doing with Hawaiian Electric to look at hydrogen energy storage 
what they're doing on Molokai and on the other islands with renewable energy storage. And um, it was a really great discussion, um, brought in some great ideas. Uh, the big focus was on if you're going to do battery storage, you have to pick the right battery for the right job. And it's not just about efficiency, it's about are you going to really cycle the battery really low and then recharge it from a low state or are you going to just keep trickle charging it constantly and keeping it topped off? Um, how big is it? You know, all the factors that go into selecting the right battery for energy storage on the grid or on a big project or on a microgrid uh, were all discussed in great detail and some great uh, connections were made. Again, uh, one of the great things about having a face-to-face -face discussion is you make those connections with people and have great side detailed discussions that you just don't get when you do a teleconference. So it was a great forum and a great time to work with uh, the folks at NOHA and some great folks from the national labs, uh, including Dr. Borian Law, who actually worked at HCAT uh, for many, many years, way before Rachel and I worked there. Yes. We got to spend some time with him yesterday talking about what his specialty is, and he's a battery expert. Uh, he works at Idaho National Labs now, and we have, now have a really great connection at Idaho National Labs with, with Dr. Law. And it was a good, good forum. Uh, thanks again to Greg Barber and, uh, and all the folks at NOHA. We not only had a good discussion, but we got a great tour of NOHA. Um, and one of the things that strikes me is one of the companies there, and I don't remember the name of the company, but you probably can figure it out. They're the only ones there. They do desalinization of deep ocean seawater. They, they desalinate the water, they add minerals back to the water to give it uh, the right mineral content, and they bottle it and then they, they send it out and it sells for a couple, like five, six, seven dollars a bottle. So it's pretty expensive water, um, but it's a market. And what, what intrigues me about it is when I start talking about hydrogen and hydrogen technology to everybody, the first thing they say is, well, where's the business case, Stan? You know, does the pencil out? And I go, well, where do you pencil out taking water, salt water, desalinizing it, putting some minerals back in and selling it for a zillion times more than it costs you to make it? And there's a market for that. So I think it's just a matter of maybe figuring out the right business to, to do the hydrogen, the right way to do the hydrogen will get us a good business case. So it was really supporting me, at least emotionally and psychologically, that <laughs> there's a case for hydrogen because you can sell water for uh, 6 or $7 a bottle in Japan. Um, then there's probably a way we can do hydrogen here with all the natural resources we have. But we also got to see um, Mitch Ewan's hydrogen project down there. We got to see the uh, a lot of the operations at NOHA and what they're doing. We got to look at OTEC and talk to the experts running the ocean thermal. Uh, we had Dr. Kroc on here before talking about OTEC and that technology. It's, it's amazing. But the challenges that they have with corrosion and things like that on the system and getting it net positive on the energy side, we talked in great de detail about that. and. Um, really understand the technology much better now. So great, great opportunity there. And I know you've been down to NOHA a couple times and we've had the chance yes. to visit Greg Barber you know, individually, but that's a, a really cool place and they do a lot of, a lot of great stuff. So one thing I didn't know about them was they're self-sustaining. Mm. They actually do not get any funding from the state. They have to sustain their own operations. So they charge rent to the companies that work down there and they're looking at growing. They're about halfway through their growth um, projections that they, they project out. So if you're looking to do some good research or develop a business that uh, uses uh, deep water ocean uh, technology or just very, very cold water from, from uh, 3,000 feet down, talk to Greg Bar Barber at Nelha and they might have a place for you to set up a project. So I think it's about time for us to take a short break here. We'll be back in about a minute with Rachel and Stan. Hey, how you doing? Uh, welcome to Abachi Talk. My name is Andrew Lanning. I'm your co-host. And we have a nice program here every Friday at 1 o'clock uh, on Think Tech Studios where we talk about technology and we have a little bit of fun with it. So join us if you can. Thanks. Aloha. Aloha. I'm Kirsten Baumgart-Turner, host of Sustainable Hawaii. Every Tuesday at noon, we talk about issues important to Hawaii's sustainability, the issues of conservation, renewable energy, uh, land management, food and energy security, and other issues that are extremely important as the World Conservation Congress approaches in the first week of September, and next year's World Youth Congress that's taking place here that's focusing on sustainability as well. 
please tune in. Join us as we highlight all the good things that are happening to achieve sustainability in Hawaii. Mahalo. Hi, I'm Ethan Allen, host of Likeable Science here on thinktechhawaii.com. I hope you'll join me every Friday at 2 p.m. to discover what's likable about science. Hey, welcome back to my lunch hour. Stan Energy Man here with Rachel James, the energy woman extraordinaire. Oh, good. <laughs> so, we're having a, a discussion here on the break about um, some of the great things that are going on, but one of them's ours. One of them is what we do um, for the state of Hawaii, and that's our um, hydrogen uh, implementation working group. And uh, we don't normally advertise uh, that other than on the state website, but uh, it's, it's open to the public, and we really would like a lot more public uh, participation in it. We do get several uh, regulars in there, um, including some of the local companies. But um, Rachel, I, we got the agenda here. It's we on the uh, 21st next week, uh, Wednesday, I believe. It is Wednesday at 8.30 a.m. Okay. Um, and we're pretty good about staying on task. We go for about two hours mm -hmm. um, and we discuss a number of topics. What's really interesting is for people who have been coming um, for like successive meetings, they get to see projects grow. Um, and so this next meeting, we'll talk a bit about Mitch's project on the Big Island, his h and &E um, So um, we'll get an update on where not only the infrastructure, but also where the bus pieces are for his hydrogen project. Um, we'll also talk about his plan for um, hydrogen implementation in Hawaii, which I think eight years he, ago or so He drafted was it? a great plan. Yeah. Right? And we're and now in the in the thrust of implementing the plan. I think the hydrogen mm -hmm. implementation coordinator was first of those efforts. Um, so we'll revisit kind of um, the pathway kind of that he set forward. the plan. Yeah. yeah. We'll do that. Um, we'll talk a bit about the Kunia Agricultural Project. Um, and that's with Lamplighter Energy. And we'll also talk about Waimea Nui efforts with Paul Pontio. And we'll do a bit of a recap from the World Conservation Congress, um, discuss some of our lessons learned, as well as our time in the Hawaii Pavilion. And we'll talk a bit about our efforts there at HCAT. Great. Yeah, it was uh, the, the um, Big Island is actually one of the focal points for hydrogen. And Definitely. I don't think a lot of people realize that. So. Uh, even as part of the energy storage um, discussions we had at Nelha, uh, we went up to visit uh, Blue Planet Research up there and they gave a tour to, and there must have been 75 or 100 folks, because there was actually a tour there when we showed up at the ranch and uh, got a great tour from Hank Rogers and Paul, um, just a big, big group they took through. But there's a lot going on in the Big Island. And it, it really strikes me as uh, one of the best locations in the state to really kind of kickstart hydrogen um, in the transportation sector and also in the industrial sector. But there's some projects going on up there that, um, that I'm interested in maybe doing a couple of shows on this year that will talk about microgrids and off-the-grid um, communities that are being designed as off-the-grid communities on the Big Island. And um, we're, we're really we're following those things closely and we don't advertise them much, we don't talk about them much on the show, but I think they're getting to the point where we kind of will start highlighting them and looking at them because these are the things that we do talk about during our implementation working group and, and talk about the future and how we're getting there. Because I think for most people in Hawaii, if they just showed up at one of these meetings, they'd be really surprised how far we've actually come in the last two or three years in getting hydrogen on the map in Hawaii. Um, Another place is uh, forklifts and, and other equipment, tour buses and things like that. Um, we are working a lot with the local industries and seeing where there's a ability to put hydrogen, commercial off-the-shelf hydrogen equipment um, out in the, in the warehouses as material handling equipment, getting them serviced by local companies and helping the community college set up curriculum for, um, for helping teach how to work with fuel cells and working with some of the OEMs, uh, equipment manufacturers on them providing training for their particular type of equipment with some of the local companies. So things are happening, probably not at the speed of light like most people mm -hmm. would like, but a lot's going on in Hawaii with hydrogen. And I just had a great talk with um, Daryl Wilson, who's been a guest on our show here. He's the head of um, Hydrogenics. I just talked to him this morning. Um, they're out of Canada and provide quite a bit of the uh, of the fuel cell equipment that we use here in Hawaii. And he, again, um, definitely identified Hawaii as a place where their company 
wants to stay engaged and wants to help uh, get us moving forward because they see the real potential here. So we're really excited about, uh, about that opportunity. And th that's kind of the, the topics that, that we go over in our working group. And we'd love to hear more from the community if there's areas where the community thinks we should be focusing or good ideas on how we could move forward. We always could, could take some of those, get those uh, thoughts from the community. I agree. It's a good opportunity to have dialogue. So um, it's awesome for us to be able to get information out about what we're doing. But then we also get these gems of um, not only critiques, but also suggestions for how we can better disseminate that information. So I think it's an awesome opportunity to have some good two-way conversation. Hey, can you talk a little bit? I know this is kind of a surprise to you, so oh, surprise. Oh, gosh, I don't know. <laughs> um, a little bit about um, an update on, on what we're doing with Katie and, um, and the uh, sure. Center for... Uh, um, tomorrow's, leaders. tomorrow's Leaders. Definitely. So Katie was a guest um, a couple weeks back, mm -hmm. and we talked briefly about our project. Um, and essentially what we're wanting to do is that educational piece. So um, we're working with high school juniors and seniors. We have a group of five students um, from public and private high schools across the state. And what they'll be working with us on is not only getting more information about fuel cell technology and hydrogen capabilities in Hawaii, um, but we're also looking to them to really capture that story and to be able to share it in a way that's relevant to their generation. Um, so what we struggle with often in not only in hydrogen and fuel cell electronic vehicle information, um, we struggle generationally in making sure that the next generation, the one that we're preparing for, really understands the efforts that we're undertaking um, and is able to plug in when we kind of hand the baton off. Um, and so much of our work will be working with what they call non-traditional leaders. Um, so people who may not necessarily be the captains of the football team or the people who stand up in front the and volunteer. Right. Yeah. Um, but people with definite skill sets um, that would be conducive to being effective leaders. And so really building up the confidence, but also providing them with the tools they'll need to be able to be effective leaders. Um, and so our work with them will involve educating about hydrogen and fuel cell vehicles, but also sharing our leadership paths, um, sharing with them that non-traditional leaders um, often are the leaders that people really need, even if they're not the ones that always stand up in front. Um, so it's kind of a, it's a, it's a neat story between hydrogen and non-traditional leaders. We talked about it a bit mm -hmm. a little while ago, just that hydrogen is this fuel source that if we started there, people would wonder why we went to gasoline. Um, but because we started with gasoline, and now we're trying to t transition to something that's a bit non-traditional, there's a bit of hesitance there. Um, and so what we're really working to do is to evidence the applicability um, and how readily applicable it is, but also how relevant it is and how much it's needed and how it's really the way that we should be directing our efforts. So. Yeah, so thanks to Katie and the Center for uh, involving us in their program because we see it as a great opportunity and something we're looking forward to participating in. And we also have help in this uh, Mr. Colonel slash Mr. Walt Kaniakua, who is a PhD, master's degree, multi times <laughs> the list over. Goes on. <laughs> Just Mr. Experience in, in the world, worked with Senator Noy for many years, worked with. Um, Oh gosh, Tulsi Gabbard for a couple of years and who Senator knows that Hirono. Senator Hirono. He's just like Mr. Experience. So he's going to help us also work with these kids and, and get them, uh, like Rachel says, get them a, a real solid uh, bite into the future and, and make them uh, feel like they're really invested in the future and that they, can, they have a role as a leader in, the, in directing Hawaii's future, even at a young age. Um, one of the things that I was made aware of as a as a parent and and bringing uh, my son up was the fact that uh, you know when you ask a child um, what they want to be when they grow up, it seems like just kind of a fun question for us. But if the child doesn't know and doesn't say anything, that's actually a big sign that you've got a problem that you gotta you know if they if they don't have anything in front of them, you know that means as a parent you're probably not exposing them to the kind of mm -hmm. things that that they need to see that to mm -hmm. make a pick and make some choices of where they should be. And if you don't have a vision in front of you, that also slows down and, and, and holds you back on your learning. So um, I think it's great that we're, we're involved with the Center for, um, for Non-Traditional Leader. Center for Tomorrow's, tomorrow's Leaders. Tomorrow's Leaders, Tomorrow's Leaders. I'll mm -hmm. get it one of these days. The last thing I wanted to talk about a little bit was um, the Blue Planet Bash. It was a great, it was the Blue Tie Bash, the first ever, um, Blue Planet fundraiser. It was at the convention center up on the fourth floor, um, hosted by Blue Planet Foundation. So Jeff Michalina was there with his lovely uh, um, significant other. Je um, Hank Rogers was there. 
all kind of really, really rich people were there. Not me, I'm not rich, but they were rich. Um, doing some great stuff over uh, helping raise uh, funds. They had a silent auction. They had a real auction with, um, oh, what was the surf guy? I, I hate getting old. Anyway, he's been announcing the surf um, forever and ever, and he's a professional auctioneer. He did just an awesome job with the live auction, and they raised, I believe, over $100,000 um, Wednesday night for that auction. It was great, and it's a great cause. Blue Planet does some awesome things uh, across our state and actually around the world. Um, they, they do reach out to the other Pacific Island nations in particular uh, who are in the same boat as Hawaii with um, fossil fuel dependency and trying to get the other nations off of fossil fuel dependency as well. And Hank Rogers, he's got, he's got the thing nailed. He understands the economic side. He understands the environmental side. He understands the just make it right for your kids piece. He's right on the mark. So, you know, props to uh, Hank Rogers for a great foundation and Jeff for running a great foundation and um, a great event on Wednesday where we, we actually had a blast of a time thanks to Wally and his wife um, we were at their table with some, some great folks, including Carol Kai um, and her significant other. Uh, we were just, it was a blast. We had a great time. Um, and closing off the evening was uh, on four hours notice. I guess Hank tried recruiting Willie Kay to do, the, do a set at the, at the thing as part of the fundraiser. And Willie had a conflict. So he initially said he couldn't do it. And then four hours before the, the uh, Blue Planet ba um, Blue Tie Bash kicked off, Willie called Hank on the cell phone and said, hey, guess what, I can do it now. And he came over to the convention center and at the end of the evening did a short set for the group there and, and it was fantastic. Willie, Willie K in person is just unbelievable. You just, he's a, he's a force to be reckoned with in the music world. Um, when he starts singing opera, everybody just, their jaw drops to the floor. And it's, it was uh, fun to look around the, my wife. I'm looking around the corner to see how she's enjoying the thing. And she had a smile on her face she couldn't wipe off with a, a sledgehammer. She just was enjoying the daylight out of Willie Kay. So it was a great evening, great time with Blue Planet. I'm looking forward to next year. Um, I told Wally I'd actually make some COA stuff to, for the silent auction. So um, he better keep me in mind for next year and I'll, I'll help do some stuff for, for Blue Planet. But it was, a, it was a great, great evening and um, a great time. So yeah, you can still donate to Blue Planet if you want to do some uh, donations and write them off on your taxes. Just talk to Hank Rogers and send a note to Blue Planet and look them up on the web and I'm sure they'll give you a way to, to put some money in there so they can keep doing what they do to save the world. And maybe even get us to Mars, you never know. Hank's, Hank's into space too, so he might get us to Mars with Elon Musk, you never know. You never know. But hey, that about does it for us on Stan Energy Man this Friday. So thanks a lot, Rachel, for helping me uh, sure, pull off today's me. show. And uh, we look forward to seeing everybody next week on Stan Energy Man here at ThinkTech Hawaii. Aloha.